Uh, thank you for uh, coming for this session on what is sustainability in lesson planning. I thought on today's keynote speaker by Mr. Garrett, he surprised me. I had somebody from art using a map. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about something that you call a map, but what it actually is is this data capture. Now these maps, I'll go into them in a little bit of detail, is anything you can put onto a spreadsheet, you drop it into the program, and if you have an XY coordinate, maybe an XYZ coordinate, it comes up on a map. And what you get are patterns and trends. And patterns and trends are so important in areas of science, business, real estate, uh, social studies, because they're showing us what is happening. It's showing us grouping. I'm going to go to the next slide here. Let's see. OK. So uh, my name is Jerry Bartz, as I, for a GIS coordinator at Brookhaven College. And somebody might ask, you know, what is, why are you talking about lesson plans? What is your experience in sustainability? Well, here's some of my sustainability project experiences. Back in 1970, I helped reduce freshwater lake eutrophication. Big word. What it means is that the algae was building up in the lakes. It was taking out all the oxygen through the decay. It was settling to the bottom. Eventually, the lake disappears. What we found out is that it was due to phosphate in wash day detergents. So that's where I started. Uh, my master's thesis, I. Uh, did a work on faith in radioactive elements in the environment in western Puerto Rico under the then Atomic Energy Commission. So you get to see a depth of what I can do in chemistry, what I can do in math, what I can do in models. In 1993, I pulled off the first sequestering of radioactive waste at a military nuclear facility without having one of my workers exposed to radiation. In 2011, biodiversity, I have over 800 spottings and 300 species identified on places like iNaturalist and Project NOAA. And then in 2016, like I was talking about, that is probably my 15 minutes of uh, professional glory. I actually had them stop lease fracking. They withdrew the lease on the Lake Louisville Dam. And that was done using mapping, GIS. Oh, so all of this was done with GIS? The 2011 and 2016 was done with GIS. I could have uh, done a I could have done 1970, but they didn't have GIS there. And my master's thesis, I, I surely could have used GIS for it instead of the raw mapping that I did. But it, it's capable of it. Okay, educator experience. I have a BS in chemistry, an MS in geology, the infamous PhD ABD. Uh, that means anything but dissertation. In this case, it means anything but my second draft. I'm probably one of the few students that went with my second draft, went into industry, and the company I worked for in R&D patented my dissertation. I have four patents as a scientist, so that's pretty good. OK, uh, I have four and a half years 
using a Texas teacher's license in chemistry and physics. So I know how to talk to students, to pedagogy. I know what they're looking for. Uh, one of my students uh, achieved National Merit Scholar. Another one is a Washington, D.C. political consultant. And these are students from South Dallas, by the way. From Brookhaven? Not from Brookhaven. Faith Family Academy, if you know where that's from. Okay. Two years adjunct professor of geology at UT Austin. I got a fellowship for teaching at excellence. And then two years as a tutor in geospatial technology, GIS. And I'm a contributing editor to three IS, to three GIS textbooks. So I love the subject. So when we talk about students and we talk about sustainability, we talk about the importance of getting sustainability concepts to our students. But all of our students are different. They have different needs, different interests. For instance, for the business major, he was an interesting one in the Dallas Morning News. Tequila producers lay groundwork for sustainability. Sustainability of the agave plant. For the environmental science majors, sustainability may mean, as I did, Dallas geologist warns of fault lines underneath the Lake Louisville Dam, which was at that time uh, ranked as the eighth most hazardous dam in the United States. And very fortuitously, I gave a pre presentation showing where the proposed fractures were going, which I proposed. Within one or two days, that dam failed within 300 feet of one of my fracture zones. Now, we didn't have a lot of water going, but the backside sort of collapsed, and we, they, they had some problems. Pardon? Uh, the, the fracking system, uh, that was on a federal lease. What happens with your, when, when you have a waterway that comes, uh, a dam, a lake that, that we built, uh, that becomes government property. And so the uh, area that they wanted to frack was actually in the lake, in a fracture system that would have connected directly to the dam, and you never can tell what could happen. Now, for our biodiversity science major, sustainability may mean here is photo documentation in 2019 of two species in the Caribbean that, that I, I did. And it's very important as we get to be citizen scientists that we are able to say that we actually have these species, and this is the first time they're in this area. We are now showing that that area has increased biodiversity, which is SDG 14, marine life. And then for all of our DCCD students, sustainability involves sustainable cities. And all of these sustainable cities our economic pr prosperity, social equality, and environmental quality. So all of your students that you have have to have some interest in sustainability. In 2016, the UN put forth 17 sustainable development goals. And these reflect environmental concerns and human aspirations for peace and justice in future generations. Sustainability is not a choice. It's a necessity. Now, I, I want to read from something that I, I, I put here. Sustainability is not a choice. It is a necessity. Without it, the human species will suffer extinction. 
which was the faith of 99% of the species that existed on Earth during a 3.5 billion year span of Earth. The human species has proved this resilience approximately 75,000 years ago the human species survived extinction and uh, what uh, the studies found was that mankind was limited to between whichever study you go as few as 40 to 1,000 breeding pairs. That is why we have that same maternal DNA that we all have. Some have attributed this event to a global winter crop failure caused by the uh, eruption of the supervolcano Toba. So sustainability for us, we have to be able to sustain. Usually I will say I'll, I'll deal with food and water and I'll get to that later because that's a necessity. But really this is about social justice and sustainability. So let's take a look at, at this. Well, whenever we're talking about lesson plans, we've noticed that within the United States as whole, our test scores have been declining. And then I came across this article by Shigata Mira. He's a TED Prize winner for 2019. And he came up with a, a, a statement and he says, our schools aren't broken, they're just outdated. And what he went into was with a computer study and he found out by using computers, letting the students with their curiosity discover and keep on working out problems with a minimum level teacher. The teacher did not even have to know the subject matter. The teacher only had to encourage the students. And Mitra went out and he tried this out on a dis distant village and after he tried it out and after he tested it, his students tested out as some of the best students in the private colleges in India. Most of our, stu most of our teachers you know, don't like to get involved with the computers, particularly something like a mapping program or, or something like GIS, because they don't know it. But they don't have to know it. The students will learn it. And that's all they have to be is encouraged. So Mitra's method fostered problem solving and critical thinking. This is what the private sector is saying they need our students to have. They develop computer inquiry skills. Again, this is what industry says they want with our graduates. And the third thing, it promoted collaborative teamwork. The students were helping one another. They did not need the teacher, they helped one another. And again, this is probably the third trait that our private sectors want in our graduates. Many people are visual learners. And so we can see that with our students. They look a lot at this. So let's start using the computer screens the Google screens, whatever screens. Actually, I can take all my maps and I can put them out on this cell phone to tell you the truth. So these what we call maps or expressions are universal languages for organizing and communicating concepts. But now, how do we incorporate sustainability into our lesson plans for a student body with diverse interests?
I found on the web this particular, uh, what we call a story map. And this is what we're trying to encourage the students to develop. It's called a story map. So they can express their views. They can go and they can grab images. They can put these images in into something a, a lot more powerful than a PowerPoint. We're talking about something that you can zoom into areas. You can cover many, many areas. So let's see. And this was on redlining and racial capitalism. As you look over here, I, I put my comments. OK, I said, the first topic is redlining and racial capitalism in Louisville, Kentucky in 1937. The legal language can get a, a bit in, in, uh, insensitive as it was at that time. But let's go and let me go and take a look at C-17, I think I have. This is what the student embedded. So he found old records. And he embedded it in here. And you go through here, and this is a form for uh, obtaining mortgages. And you can scroll through. Yeah, yeah, it, it, can, it, it can be done here. Now, right over here is the racial discrimination. That particular applicant got a C because it was in an, in an entirely black neighborhood. So I quickly went and I went to B15 right over here. I'm going to close this. And if I got this right, go all the way to the bottom. In a white area, very similar. This is a white applicant. And for the loan, B. Now, your students, I, I just did that. I don't know what else is in there. There's a lot of data in there. This student went and did a lot of work. Now, the quality, since I teach GIS, the quality is really basic. But with that basic ability to that student, he caught my eye. He was able to communicate. He was able to communicate to somebody he didn't know. And this is available throughout the world. Now, another amazing thing about this student, he came in and he switched presentation modes and put in a timeline of photos from 1860 all the way to 2019. And each of these photos, you can come over here, 10. And it gives an address on it. And you can go down to here and see that it is on North Street. And you can see the exhibit that he has. So he is doing a, a lot of work. Then he went view neighborhoods, compare segregation, compare income. Compare poverty, compare race. This student did an excellent job with just a bare minimal knowledge of GIS. Probably with a teacher mentor saying, you're doing a good job. I can hear Mitra now. You're doing a good job. Wow. I, I, I still cannot do GIS. 
You don't have to. Oh, I do. I think <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I didn't know about about that, but my head is running like you're saying. It's like I can do like a million things with this, I and I teach English. Yeah. Well, wait, 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 wait till you see what else I have for you on on this. So I'm not going to stop here. I'm. Uh, I mean. As far as this, I'm going to give you an area, and it's all in here, where you can go, and it's broken down according to subject areas, and you can start teaching tomorrow. Yeah, well, it, there, there, is, there is a lot to learn. It's, it's sort of like, an, it really is a, sort of like an advanced PowerPoint, you know, but, but but what, what it gives you, it gives you a live map where you can go in and look at it. And it gives you that ability to take that spot on the map and put in things like documents, pictures, statistics. So you start creating socio, uh, socio-historical, you know, Right, to that. right. It's, it's really, it, it's truly an amazing tool. Well, then as I was going through again, and I went and I said, wow, this presentation chronicles one person's viewpoint on the March for Fair Housing, circa 1967, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Guess who was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Martin Luther King. No, no, I wish he were. I was. Okay, and the leader of the march happened to be my religious mentor, Father James Grappi. And so I had somewhat of a connection to this, and so I was looking at it, and I, I wanted to see it from this person's viewpoint. And mine is a, a little different, I'll tell you why I think his is a little different, because there were more white college students in those marches. But what you will see is mostly black faces. Okay. This was uh, a sort of a semi-community effort where we said, you know, this is unfair. Um, I, I guess back in back in the 60s, I, I went to a uh, integrated uh, high school. So, you? yeah, oh yeah. Where? Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In the 60s it was integrated? Y yes, it was, it was a technical and trade school, so you got in there on merit. Oh. And since you got in there, but it was an all boys school, okay. and of course, guess who had the best football team in the state? <laughs> We had over 2,000 boys, and some of them were in plumbing and auto mechanics and had natural biceps, you know. But anyway, so this is a picture in, in Milwaukee where uh, we had Afro-American groups. And uh, yes, we had our people that were, were biased on, on color, but um, those of us that were exposed uh, to the uh, black community, speaking of it. Plus, I, I'm, I'm Polish. Oh, here, here, here comes an a interesting, interesting little bias over here. Uh, I, my family's also mixed race, okay? So not, not mine, but my daughter is married to a man of color. And so, uh, excuse the expression, you, if you, are you from the Dallas area? No. No, okay. You, you familiar with the expression bright? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so anyway, so I, I have three, three uh, grandchildren that are, are, are mixed race. And um, they, they're, they're wonderful grandchildren, and I have one of them that just is uh, really kind of, I'm going to get you, you know. And so the other day, uh, the... Uh, one of the counselors came up to, to my uh, granddaughter and said, uh, uh, what's your culture? 
And my granddaughter looked at him. I'm pure Polish. My daughter's pure Polish. My granddaughter says, I'm Polish. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, here's, here's, uh, here's the viewpoint. Now, no, notice the difference in the style. Now, we have a little bit uh, more advanced. Notice over here on this side how this person uses larger text so you can read it. But still, you know, that other person caught my attention. So a, a little bit difference in style here. You can either uh, drop down and hit this, and it will go to here, but what you need to do is go over and press this button. Now this is uh, historical data, and I say I, I, I lived through this, and what you can do with this is you can actually zoom in and get a good viewpoint of what Milwaukee looked like back in the 60s. That students should have done better, but I sort of like this, this presentation. And went over here and showed the typical house. This is the person, Fred Reed, and I, I, I never met the man, but this is his story. So the way he has this set up, you don't move down, you click on the picture, and now you have historical footage of what the fair housing was, March was. Well, and not only that, but look at, here's where it occurred. And he's got an address there, and then you can zoom in. Notice I'm moving along. So you can connect it to Google Earth too, because that's very specific. So if you do the link to that address with Google Earth, you can physically see it. Right. If Google Earth has a 1967. Well, no, but I mean yeah. so that they can compare yeah. then and now. Yeah. So like if you're talking about comparison and contrast for me, for my case. Right, and you can timeline on, uh, on Google Earth also. Excellent, excellent, I agree with that. And by the way, uh, when you get into advanced and you can always give me a call on it, I can show you how to convert a KML, a Google uh, uh, known markup language into uh, GIS. Here the uh, student or, or the man talks about uh, the black uh, churches in the area that were in with the marches, the, and mentions Father Grappi. Uh, no, I'm Roman Catholic, oh. so he's my priest. Uh, no, he, he's, he's my spiritual mentor. Uh, I, I grew up with him, and uh, he helped me through some rough times in my life. And that again, when we go and we take a look at that, the student did a really good job. He, he's got the uh, Eagles Club identified over here. We have, when you see this is called pixelation, we've gone down too far. But anyway, I'm going to get out of this one and go back to PowerPoint slide to the next one that I thought. Okay, now what I want to look at is the UN SDGs. Uh, I've been following these for many years. By the way, if you're not aware of it, these are supposed to be all done by 2030. This is the second attempt of sustainable development goals. Some of them worked, some of them didn't in the first one. So we're re-looking at them. But this is a, a really good thing to show to your students. And you can see how it's coming up. Again, we're dealing with the dot patterns. And now when you go to the patterns, 
you go on here and you get actual values and name of the country. As a matter of fact, you can actually take these boxes and you can put other categories in them. You've got a lot of data there. You, you've got a lot of data you can, you can work with. And again, I have proprietary uh, databases on these that are easier to get. You can get them from the UN, but they're really rough. I have them uh, pretty well worked up. Uh, th when you're looking at this point over here, it's a column one of many columns in a very long, what looks like an Excel sheet. And you can go over there and say, I want to look at this column, I want to look at this column. Okay, so you, ha you have actually, through the Esri Corporation, access to 150 computer activities in science, history, geography, elementary science, and social science topics. There are 15-minute activities accessible from any internet-capable device. That means it can be a tablet, it can be an iPad, it can be a Chromebook, or a laptop. And they can be loaded on Blackboard, or your Blackboard equivalent. Like you say, all you need is the internet. It's built to share. And I will give you also access to the ability to take, it comes normally in a PDF. I have a program there that will convert them over to Microsoft Word. You can put whatever questions you want you, on this. We have it with just your basic questions. And, and we'll go over that and show you what and one example looks like, and, but you can modify it. And to help you as the granny teacher, guess what? On the first set of exercises, they have the answers for you that you don't have to give to the students. Now, I just want to bring you back. So sustainability is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We've always had that. I've always had that. I never wanted to use more than I needed. And that's what we need to stress. We want our students not only to use what they need in the environment, but to make it a better place, not only for themselves, but for the generations that follow them. Here's what one looks like, and here's the one I chose, because I said, what I want to look at is food supply. That's number two of the SDGs. Without food, without water, you can forget about the other ones. But that doesn't mean you're, you're restricted to it. But I just wanted to take a look for that. So what it gives you is the critical things that I remember from teaching. You will, the student will learn, the student will learn, the student will learn. And we also have this geared for Texas. The quarter yeah, OK. So uh, you see your learning objectives. And now what, what you can do, uh, not the following it yet, OK. And that is basically how the farming one opens up. Whoa. I bet I got too many open. OK. I got that. That, that, was, uh, that was something else I was doing. Uh, while that was up there, you notice that that was a flash that one of the layers that I have up there uh, requires a license, uh, a very, very high license. What Esri does to every K through 12, you can get a free license. Is that per school? Per, per, school. per school. Per school. And, but that covers 
everybody in that organization. Now, if you're from Brookhaven, uh, a license covers everyone in the organization as long as they're using it for education purposes. Now, the reason I backed up on that is because Brookhaven has their license. It's my, you know, that, that I use, that my students use, that faculty at Brookhaven uses. But administration, our, our main offices, they need a business license. They can't use our license. They, they have their own. So if, you're, if your administration decides that they want to use it for things like dashboards to measure uh, uh, some of the goals that they're trying to achieve and that, then you need a, a, they need a separate license. Not you, not your students, but this is strictly for the students. So. We take a look at this, and we can see that we can collapse it and just get details like this, or we can expand it like this. Now, what I've gone through is on these sheets, they, they won't come up very well. So I want you to take a look at these are the questions that the students will be asking. And in italics are the answers for the questions. And again, this is editable. You don't give them the answers <laughs> to your students. So it says, click the UR above to start the map, which we have. And what does editable mean? They'll have to look that up. OK, then it says, click on a country to reveal a pop-up. OK, let's, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Now you're going to see the quality of the maps. So I want to go to the Sudan. I click on it. And remember I said you can put a lot in those columns? Now, does the number mean a decrease or an increase? Well, that's OK. That's one of the questions, by the way. So you look over here and you see 46. Down to 2015, it's 29. Now here's your critical thinking, student. Why do you think that there's less irritable land? What has happened to the land? Is it being developed? Yeah. So then the next question is, click on a country. OK, using the world agricultural legend which countries have over 60% irritable land? So what we're teaching the student now is how to read a map, what we call a map. But really, what did we call it before? We called it a graph, didn't we? In mathematics, we called it a graph because here are your values. So now what we're teaching the student to do is associate a color with a percentage of irritable lands, and that these are classifications. And then it says, in one of these, let's take a look at Saudi Arabia. What's unusual about that? So we go out over here, and notice around Saudi Arabia, we have three to four percent, 37, 28 percent. Saudi Arabia went from 40 to 81 percent. How do they do that? Irrigation, right? Where did they get the water from? Well, the sea, and they desalinated, right? That cost a lot of money. That cost, a, they got a lot of money. <laughs> OK, and then we look at some other areas. And I'm going to zoom out. And we look at Russia. And we're looking at 13%. Big country. But what is different about Russia than the ones to the south? Does this have to do with the ice cap melting because they're so far north? 
so far north, so it's colder. So you don't have uh, uh, a, a lot of a lot of land that that you can you can farm. You've got some permafrost there. Uh, Siberia. I don't know if it ever gets warm enough to to do anything. <laughs> but what did you do? You just asked me a question. That's what we want the students to do. And then the construction with permafrost is completely different than the construction here as well. Again, more questions, more critical thinking. You know what my issue is? My students don't have this in their classroom. They don't have laptops. They, they, we can't even, I, I'm, I'm in an underprivileged school. Yeah. They don't even take books. Yeah. Um, I have your same problem, but I'm wondering, is it, would it be just enough by using your teachers to talk about it, and then based on their questions? Like I'm doing here. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we still could do that. Yeah. That could, that could so be it part becomes of an lesson. integrated lecture. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right. Believe me, you can get them to put them on their cell phone if you... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that they can have that. Their cell phone is internet connected. They can get this map. I mean, it's going to be difficult to. Yeah. No, but I do that. They all have a cell phone, and I do that. I make them do things with their phone because you're right. They're on their phone 24/7, right. and unless you use the phone to keep them engaged, yeah. it's okay. you know, yeah. That makes I think. So, so you can you can have them do it, and they'll consider that a challenge. I I'll tell you what, if I were a teacher in that situation, I'd bring up this map, and you would see. <laughs> well, we're 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 coming to an end here on on amount of time. I I thank you. So I have added all this where you can get geo inquiries. And it's right over here on, on this page right over here. And then I go and I put all the 150 lessons in all the areas that you have them. And this is what they're like. Now, if you have any questions, you know, you, you can call me. I've given you cheap cheat sheets on this. Uh, I've, even, uh, I've even gone through on some of these things and said, hey, you want to see a pretty map? Here's a URL for it. <laughs> if, if you have anything you have, please contact me by email. And then after you contact me by email, Give me your phone number where I can contact you, okay? And I will get back to you when I can, and and happily. And you know you can spread this out to your to your fellow teachers.